NordVPN.com slash Fightful makes my browsing experience better. Way better than yours if you don't use it. Why? Because I can block online trackers. I can block annoying pop-up ads and malware. I can browse safely, securely, wherever I am, even if I'm right here on all my devices. This laptop, actually this is a desktop, what, what am I saying? But this laptop right here, this phone right here, that router over there, the TV over there, all with NordVPN.com slash Fightful. You can also save on pay-per-views. Maybe you want to check out AEW without commercials. Maybe you miss the old WWE Network. Maybe you want to buy a big UFC pay-per-view with an overseas service at a much more affordable rate. NordVPN.com slash Fightful not only has you covered, but when you get one of their plans, you're effectively going to save yourself money. And I'm going to save you some more. Four months free on top of that deal and a 30-day money-back guarantee. NordVPN.com slash Fightful. What's up, you guys? Sean Ross Sapp, Fightful, here with a name you know. Even though he doesn't do many of these, I I'm a member of the Two Timers Club here. A rare <laughs> Ricky Shane Page interview. How you doing, man? Good to hear from you again. Good. I'm doing good. I mean, yeah, I don't really like doing interviews that much, so. I know, and I'm, I'm, I always feel like privileged when I get a Ricky Shane Page interview, which has happened twice now, because I know that you don't do many of these, uh, but I mean, you got big career changes going on, you're, you're with MLW now, I'm excited to learn how exactly this came about. Yeah, I mean, I did the Battle Riot last year, um, that was my first time coming and working for him, and then, yeah, they asked me back earlier this year, and I think... When was it? February, January? I can't remember now. My <laughs> my brain is all over the place. But yeah, I it just kind of happened. It happened real fast. Uh, the last show, the last tapings, the one before the last tapings, um, I w had the craziest travel schedule of my like entire career. Yeah. And I showed up, and they were like, "Hey, you're doing this and this and this and this," and I was like, "What? What? Okay." And I just kind of did it, and I didn't really like clock what was going on and then the next show we were doing more stuff and i was like man they're really like, i'm doing a lot like this is kind of cool and then they offered me the contract and i was like oh it kind of happened out of nowhere to be honest <laughs> yeah so i mean when that happened i mean you're the type of guy that i don't think anybody would be surprised to learn that any company offered you a contract given your resume and, and your level of work in the ring uh so mlw i i hit them up immediately after i heard that and i was like Please tell me more. And they were really excited to have you. But they also mentioned you're going to be helping doing like some agenting work as, as well. Yeah, I, I guess that, I, I didn't know if they were going to go public with that or not. But yes, I am. I will be working backstage as well. So, I mean, is I, I get the feeling and it's just my assumption that given your place in wrestling and how experienced you are in the places you've been, that's probably something that you've helped out with either formally or informally places before anyway. Yes, uh, both. So usually it just happens to where I'm at shows and people will come up and ask me to watch their matches or, uh, you know, friends of mine that are on television will come up and ask me to listen to their match and, and make sure, you know, everything's cool. And then uh, actually for progress, I think SummerSlam weekend pre-pandemic, uh, they brought me in to age in all the matches. And I didn't even wrestle for them. I just I just oh, did wow. that back backstage so and i've done it before when the last couple tours i've done for progress i've wrestled and um done that so a little bit of a player coach situation uh but yeah i i really enjoy doing it it's very fun it's a skill set that i think i'm good at and that uh i feel like more wrestlers should learn this and learn how to do it because you can't take bumps forever so and I, I like seeing active performers doing that even more because it's always great to get you know get people who are out of wrestling as well but Something that I've heard a lot, like, for an example, Arya Davari doing it. People are like, well, it's great because he is completely in tune with the style and pace of today as well. So we're, we're, we got a bit of everything. Uh, like, what, what was it about that that really appealed to you and said, hell yeah, I'll do that as well? Um, like I said, I've always really liked doing it. And um, it just happens to me naturally anyways. People always ask me to help them their matches. So I might as well get like paid for it now. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I just, I really enjoy doing it. I always, um, I always have better ideas for other people than I do myself half the time because 
people can do things that I can't. So I'm very limited being so big. Uh, I want to be a cruiserweight, but it's just not the cards. <laughs> so I'll have like much better ideas for other people. And and when and when you're in the match playing it, you kind of get stuck in your like, okay, this is like an RSP match. I have to do it the way I do it. And um, but when I'm looking at it through through someone else and I, it has nothing to do with me, I just become a little bit more creative. You mentioned the Battle Riot. I'm I'm a geek for Battle Royals. I love them. I don't care how terrible they are. I don't care how boring they are. I love them. It, it, I grew up loving the Royal Rumble so much, and that's a lot of like what the Battle Riot is. What was that experience like for you? Because it, it's one of those things where it's you'll see Ty of Valkyrie in there. You'll see Gangrel in there. Savio Vega's going to pop up there doing two or three different things. Like It's, it's just a lot of fun. It, it appeals to my ADHD that I was diagnosed with when I was younger because it's constant it's excitement but also it can be chaotic to put together or be a part of as well 100 percent, especially for like a tv product you know there's a lot there's a lot more that goes into it because the, the announcers have to be on, on on point the camera people have to be on point the agents have to be on point the wrestlers have to be on point it's just like a big team effort yeah um and it was super fun because again there's a lot of people that i know at mlw and a lot of people i respect and you know, and guys like Savio Vega and like Nunzio and stuff like that, like people I, I just was a fan of when I was younger. So very chaotic, very crazy, but it, it, it came off without a hitch. And it, it, I think it turned out really well. And I really liked my part in it. And uh, yeah, it's just but and I got to I got to like, you know, be in there with like Sammy Callahan, who's like a friend of mine that I've sure. known forever. And, uh, and Killer Cross, who became a good friend of mine recently. So like great guy. It was just fu- it, yeah, I love him. He's the best. And uh, it's just kind of cool to be in there and just especially like when you're in a battle royal with like some of your friends, you just kind of start joking around saying weird stuff while you're in there because you know, it's not like physically taxing too much. Most of the time you're just like trying to throw someone out. So. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just fun. I love Battle Royals too. Sammy Callahan, who I bury, I bury him privately to him because he'll always hit me up to retweet Revolver stuff. But when I say, "Hey, what's up with that contract, man? You, when, when's that contract up?" He's like, "What what are you talking about? I don't I don't know, Sammy. What what contract am I talking about, Sammy? I don't know. <laughs> uh, love that guy. He's uh, he's great. Like he's uh, and Revolver. He." books the hell out of those shows yeah he's the worst with uh, talking to him like if you need something you'll be like yo sammy <laughs> and he won't answer you for days and then like randomly he'll text you about something else that that he's doing and i'm like bro what about when i texted you a week ago and asked you this question and now you won't answer me but yeah he, Sam, sammy's the best oh he's Revolver, great revolver's killing it i mean yeah. they're doing so well those shows are awesome and they're like packing houses like it's really cool Another awesome thing you did recently, you got to go to Japan, and I remember you, you, I feel like you went there maybe once or twice right before the pandemic. I feel like you were there shortly before the pandemic and maybe a little bit before that as well, but obviously when what happens happens, you ain't going there. Like I know a lot of people who wanted to get over there and just couldn't for a couple of years. Uh, what did that mean to you to be able to uh, get back to Japan? Yeah, it was awesome. I honestly didn't think I was ever going to go back. Uh, I went five times in 2019. Wow, jeez, yeah. man. Yeah, I did. I did a lot of tours over there that that year, and then um, I've gotten to go back twice since this most recent tour. Uh, so yeah, I really didn't think I was ever gonna go back, and uh, like, I really didn't think I was gonna go back because I stopped doing death matches. So yeah. I was like, oh, like there's no way like another company's gonna like bring me over for that. So. I'm just so surprised that I got to go again, to be honest. And and I love Japan. It's like one of my favorite places I've ever been. So like uh, just being able to go there and experience the culture again. And this time I had a little bit more time. Like when I went before with BJW, I'd be there for like two weeks and I'd have like 10 shows. Yeah. So this time I was there for like a month and I had like, I think 10 or 12 shows. So I had a little bit more time to like explore Tokyo. And I was actually in Tokyo this time, like before I was always in Yokohama, which is about 40 minutes outside of, of Tokyo. So I got to like really see Tokyo a lot. And um, I, I, we did a show in Osaka and Kyoto. So I had, and I had more time there too. So we had like a little bit of time to walk around and like actually see stuff. So the BJW schedule was really, really hectic and, and, and they do it quick and fast, but the DDT schedule was a little bit more lax. So it was, it was uh, I got to experience more this time. Yeah, I loved seeing that you were you were back there. And again, like, there were so many people that wanted to go there the last few years and didn't get that opportunity. You you had mentioned that you stopped doing death matches. I remember you, you posted that publicly. You're like, hey, nothing against it. Just I, I'm going to move on from that. 
how did you feel like the reception was from fans who came to know you via death matches or, or really loved that work? Did you feel like they were understanding or did you get any blowback from it or, um, or was it, I, how was it? I think both. I think that people really enjoyed me doing that and it was something that I was very good at. Um, and I think that people, a lot of people were like, Hey man, you did your time. Like you did everything that there is to do in deathmatch wrestling. Like, you don't owe us anything anymore. Um, so I think it was a bit of a mixed bag. I'd say more positive than negative. And I think people just miss me doing that because deathmatch wrestling fans are like rabid and they're, they're loyal. Sure. So um, I think they just miss it. But like, yeah, I just I just couldn't do it anymore. It was too hard. Um, the healing process was just way too much. And like, I just I could feel myself. uh being afraid which i never was before yeah i I could feel myself kind of going like oh god no no and (laughs) that that's when someone gets hurt like not even myself like other people if i have any sort of hesitation like some i will hurt somebody and i don't want to hurt anybody because the risks are so much greater in deathmatch wrestling and and i don't think people really understand that even the some of the people that are doing them they think it's like easier or you just kind of do whatever you want. And it's like, no, you have to take even more care. And um, yeah. so I just didn't want to hurt anybody. And honestly, I have a theory as to why you signed with MLW. Okay. You needed the extra work because Ethan page moved to the United States and did not require a toy mule. That's, you know what? Probably. Uh, <laughs> I still have, I, I still have a bunch of his toys here cause I haven't seen them. Even though he lives like two hours from me. <laughs> yeah, now, he's not far. No, he's not far at all. I just haven't seen him because he's he's busy. I'm busy, but I still have a bunch of toys that I just I haven't get, got to give them to him yet. I haven't even been to his new house yet. I need I need to get up to Michigan and go see. Him. He went. He bought it in Detroit, right? Uh, somewhere outside. I'm not exactly sure where. I was gonna yes, say he's gonna get in a, that area. He's gonna get a five thousand square foot house for like twenty bucks out there. Like for it's for sure. <laughs> I randomly had to go to Detroit, like. For an indie show, it was our PW show, and uh, it was like day of kind of decision. Yeah, and I did like this run in and I cut a promo. And he, he before I got home, he texted me. He's like, "You're in Michigan," and I was like, "Yes." Uh, I was. He's like, "Why didn't you tell me?" I was like, "Bro, I just found out about it today. Like, it just came together. Like, I'm driving straight back home." He's like, "Fuck you!" Like, I was just like, "Bro, I'm sorry. I haven't seen the house yet." But yeah, it's very funny. <laughs> one of, one of my favorite like. I, I want to say interviews. It was more of a conversation where, where it was like you, him, and MJF. Was that the one where he like where MJF was showing off his his football highlights? Yes, and when he kept going, that's me. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's me. with the circles yeah. and stuff mm-hmm. around it. Yeah. And oh my. Hulk Hogan's music playing. Yeah, of course, of course, it did. Uh, yeah. He he for sure. He he didn't buy that off of iTunes. He didn't license that. He was pirating that for sure. <laughs> oh, for for sure. Uh, speaking of AEW, you had the opportunity to work a few matches there, specifically against Paul White, which is what I'm interested in, or as I call him, Tall Paul. Uh, yes. How was that experience? I mean, I know that those a lot of those matches were kind of abbreviated, but I mean, that's that's one that almost everybody that's in wrestling right now grew up watching Paul White because he's been everywhere. Yeah, that is a crazy story just in general of how it came together. Um so that was the first uh, Arthur Ashe show. Mm-hmm. So there was like 20,000 people there. I was which there. Was like, oh, were you? Yeah, That's I was like, there. <laughs> yeah, it was wild. So like the day before the show, MJF called me and he's like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? And I was like, nothing. Why? He's like, can you be in New York? And I was like, sure. He was like, <laughs> I'm probably going to get up in trouble. But he, he was like, I told them you were in New York already and they need guys. And I was like, okay. So I literally got, I went spray tanned. I took a shower, spray tanned, packed my bag, and just drove overnight to New York. And I went, I slept on Ethan Page's hotel room floor. And I woke up the next morning and I was having the free continental breakfast uh, for a room that I didn't have at the hotel. Thank you, Tony <laughs> Khan. Uh, <laughs> but but I, I was eating, and, and uh, Aubrey, the ref, came up to me and she yeah. was like, Oh, hey, do you know what you're doing today? And I was like, No. She's like, You're wrestling Paul White. I was like, Shut the fuck up I was yeah. like, no i'm not and she was like oh yeah and i was like oh uh, okay <laughs> and like that's literally how it happened so shout out mjf he's he's always looking out for me he's the best and uh yeah so it was so cool like paul's great he's a super good brother 
Uh, everybody at AEW is super nice. Like I, I don't have anything bad to say about my time there. They were so good to me, and Tony was so nice and and very um. He was just there, you know, like you could go up and talk to him. Like a lot of times he, I would just stand in the gorilla position and kind of watch him direct the show because I'm very interested in that kind of stuff. Yeah. Never. He was always cool with me standing there, you know, because it's just an extra. I'm kind of in the way. But he, he'd let me sit there. I kind of watched him do things and uh, super cool environment. Like everybody was really rad. Like, And I got to wrestle some, you know, my childhood, you know. I, I've always been told, like, because I'll, I'll try to ask and bug everybody, like, what's the, the line of thinking behind this, this, and this? And I was always told you can tell, like, what they think of repeat people who are there based on who they're booked against on those types of shows. So you're facing Matt Hardy, you're facing Paul White, you're facing John Moxley, people like that. It's like, well, that, that gives you a pretty good indication of who wants to work with them, who what they what they value of them. It's, it's like the old Sean Waltman test, too. They would say... He would be like, disguise the shits, don't bring him back. And if you saw them back and they had worked with him, well, that's a pretty good indicator. So I thought it was a pretty good indicator of how they viewed you based on who you were, were booked against. For sure. they like I got great matches there. Like, I got to wrestle Dante, Darby, Kingston, Moxley, Matt Hardy, like, you know, the, the Dark Order. Like, I, I think they knew that... Uh, I wasn't going to hurt anybody and that um, I'm professional because a lot of times, you know, they meet, they're meeting these guys day of, you know, so it's a bit hard to sometimes you don't just don't know. So even like one of the times I was in a match and, uh, and like all the guys in Dark Order knew who I was, but then like the other two in the match, like people didn't really know who they were. Uh, especially one's name's Andrew Palace. He's from Pittsburgh. And I remember just telling the guys in Dark Order like, hey, it's cool. He's good. Like, don't worry about it. Like, yeah. he's not going to he's not going to hurt you guys. So like, I think that that comes up a little bit. So yeah, they, I always got put in good spots. Like I, I wrestled, well, I remember the one time I, I wrestled Danny Garcia, uh, at the dark tapings in Orlando. And, um, before I went out, like Tony, Tony Khan got up and goes, Hey man, like you guys have never wrestled each other. I was like, yeah, no, we haven't. He's like, I was trying to find a match of you guys wrestling on the Indies. He's like, I couldn't find one. I was like, I couldn't believe that you guys have never worked. I was like, yeah, he's like, that's why I booked this match. Like have fun. I was like, Oh, thanks man. So like this is a really cool environment. Like very very I very much enjoyed my time there. It felt like you worked there like all over the map too. Like on on the east side because otherwise they'll they'll bring in people from like California when they're out there. But I mean like you're working in several different states and there are some people they'll only bring in in Florida, in Texas, and the like. So I I thought that was great. And even though you said it might get MJF in trouble, when I write the headline MJF lied to AEW, <laughs> he's on now. that that Grinch <laughs> hit the Grinch smile will pop up on his face. Like he'll <laughs> he'll love that. Like he absolutely loves that shit. Max has always been great to me. Like he, he always looks out for me and like uh, I, I can't I I can't repay him enough. Well, Max is an asshole, but his dad sends me paleo bagels, so that's that's nice. <laughs> like, I love the bagels. I'm, I'm friends with his dad on Facebook. He's wonderful. Care. He's the best. His mom's really nice, too. So I, I was... Believe, I can't believe they produced that spawn. I, I know, right? I was at a show one time, and one of my friends, she was getting ready for like a pageant or something, and she's like, man, I miss eating bagels. And I was like, MJF's dad makes paleo bagels. You should You should try them out. And she loved them. So I go and I see her like in the hallway there and Steven walks out and for the, like probably the first time ever, he wasn't recognized as MJF's dad. She goes, oh my God, are you the Pagel King? And this dude's face just lit up and he's like, you're damn right I am. I am. That's it was great. It was, that was like probably the coolest thing about that pay-per-view weekend was seeing that. It was, it was wonderful. But uh, we mentioned like, the, the Paul White thing, your, your AEW experience, your MLW run, all that. Did Impact, NWA, anybody like that ever reach out to you? Because you seemed like the type of person that I, I think they could, or I'm shocked they didn't bring in to create a little buzz. There was always, like, uh, talk of Impact, um, like, through, like, Sammy and other friends. Because, again, sure. I, I just have friends everywhere. Like, I've been wrestling for so long, and I try not to be an asshole. So, yeah. I try to... I have quite a few friends. It was always talked about. There was always like hints of ideas, but nothing concrete, nothing solid. Um, I just feel like there's a lot of wrestlers out there and there's a lot of people getting contracts and, and, and sometimes you just get lost in the shuffle. And, and, and again, I'm not 20, so <laughs> I totally get it. Like even at AEW, like I was never like, 
mad or anything like that. It was just like, I get it. They got a lot going on. The same thing with Impact. You know, they're, they're a growing company. They got a lot going on. Like, sometimes you're just not number one on the list, which is I'm cool with. You know what I mean? But I, I, I like where I've ended up. I'm very much um, excited about the future of MLW and how, like, uh, I can be able to help backstage and just help the, the product grow and take it to the next level. I'm very much into like uh, growth and um, being a part of the, of that growth, you know? So I'm, I'm very happy with ending up at MLW. Yeah. And, and even with like MLW, I think it would have been more of a fit for MLW and impact than in NWA. But like, when I think about that, I'm like, it well, it wouldn't have shocked me to see like you and Atticus and Greg all pop up there as, as a unit, because you all have created what you created outside of the auspices of nationally televised stuff. And usually companies are like, uh, let me get my hands on that, that whole thing. So I've never publicly talked about this, but um, so right maybe a few weeks before the pandemic started, um, I was hit up by Ring of Honor. Oh, okay. And, and, and what they were like, hey, do you, can you come to this date? And I was like, uh, no, I'm gonna be in Japan. And they're like, okay. And then I pitched to the to the booker at the time. I was like, hey, what do you think about me and my faction coming in? Like, you know, I think we could really do some cool stuff. We could like, you know, hop the rail, come in, whatever. And they were like, oh, well, who's in it? And I gave them the rundown of everything. And then like, didn't hear back. And then like a week later, the pandemic started. So <laughs> was that around the time when like Effie and AJ popped up in ROH? So that was like during the pandemic. Okay, that was yeah, yeah. So this was pre. This was okay. 2019. Okay, yeah. Yeah. End of 2019, the beginning of 2020, before before the pandemic even started. Gosh, with... it was. I like I've got no concept of time during that pandemic. For some reason I thought it was right right before that, but I do remember they were they were trying to undergo some like changes multiple times like around the pandemic as well because they knew that with AEW in the fold, they had to they had to step it up. They had to do some different things. Uh yeah. but I mean, is that something that you look back at and you're like, damn, wish that would have happened? Or is it something where you're like, what the hell could have happened? The world was going to go the way that it went. Yeah, I mean, honestly, just for myself, because I w was such a fan of Ring of Honor, I definitely wish it would have happened. And obviously, sure. I wish the pandemic didn't happen because. But on the other hand, the pandemic was very good for me. Like it. I, I, I thrived in 2020. Like I had, a, I had way more matches than I should have. And like, I, a lot of my storyline stuff at the time, like really took off. So it was a blessing in, in that way, but man, it would have been sick to just like hop the rail at a honor show with the four, four boys and get in there and just start beating somebody down. You know I mean? Like that would have been absolutely insane. So uh, I wish it happened, but I'm also glad that it, everything went the way it did. The way that you all have been able to just get heat is just amazing because it is it's one of those situations where people love watching you but they really enjoy being on the ride of absolutely hating you and that is that is unique and you see it a little bit more outside of WWE where people were so starved for just entertaining characters in general that they'd latch on anything but I don't feel like there's any shortage of that where, where you've been so the fact that people were along for the ride for it like, did you get anybody that was maybe a little too passionate? It was like maybe because you, you would do things specifically like that could like blur that line, you know, uh, for sure. Uh, I remember the one GCW show. Uh, I think we might have talked about this last time, but um, it was run Ricky run. Uh, yeah. It was when me and Gage were finally going to have our first like singles match for the belt. Uh, there were so many people there. That crowd was it was in Atlantic City. And they were just rowdy that night. And I remember right before we came out, I just looked back at the 440 boys and I was like, hey, don't let anybody fuck with you. Fuck these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all like, they all got like really jacked up when I, I said love it. That. And so we walked out and uh, nobody would ever touch me because I'm so much bigger than everybody, I guess. Sure. But for some reason, they'd always push on the 440 boys because they're all kind of short. Of course. So like, they, I would, I remember just turning around, and I remember seeing the full for old boys just being like pushing people left and right. <laughs> and then when I won, and the riot happened where they threw all the garbage in the ring, like it was wild. And when we were leaving, um, people started pushing, like pushing us and trying to, and trying to. And I remember somebody was, somebody was messing with Eddie only, and uh, 
I came over and 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 I I remember I just put my hand on their chest just like this and I have this move that I do it's an old school this is an old school vet trick you just kind of put your hand on someone's chest and when they push against it you just go like that and you pop them in the jaw oh nice <laughs> so I was like put my hand on him he was like trying to hit us and he was pushing on me and I just popped him in the jaw a little bit and he was like well and I was like don't touch us man like get out of here so we kind of had to a little bit fight our way out of that one um but that was probably the most uh the most intense it got to be honest so when when you come into mlw like this most recent run you're immediately put with mance like what when you're told that what's your reaction because i mean you had what i thought was one of your best matches ever was with mance been in the ring with him a whole lot like was that one of those hell yeah i'm knocking this out of the park things 100 percent. i think mance warner is the most underutilized wrongly booked person on the indies like the fact that people aren't giving him a run the way he deserves like he should have he should have won the gcw belt at some point like me and him should have went further with our with our stuff at gcw that match we had um uh, in atlantic city was one of my favorite matches and 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 we literally got people in 2021 to bite on a dusty finish like <laughs> It's you know what I mean? Like, I, I honestly, truly think that people really dropped the ball with Mance Warner. And I'm glad to see that MLW is picking it up and, and uh, trying to do something with him. And I absolutely love wrestling him. Uh, we just have good chemistry. Like, I'm never worried about it. And, uh, you know, obviously he has a promo. I have a promo. It's just like I just feel like when me and Mance are in the ring, there's just money to be made. Yeah. When I saw that was on the tapings, I was I immediately went back to Cage of Death like. Like that was the one that stuck out in in my head, and I mean, you guys have been in the ring with each other through a variety of situations. I can't remember if you because I can't remember the show itself that much, but you uh, got to work the the Ric Flair's last match show. Yes, I did. <laughs> which is <laughs> which I was there throughout that week, and you know, I I broke a lot of the stories about the the show itself, and it was it was wild. I mean, they went oh, all actually- out. To make it I happen. Have something. I have something, oh, yeah, some please. Mem- memorabilia from that show. Please. So a friend of mine uh, used to wrestle uh, in, at Beyond back in the day. He's a huge Ric Flair fan. And um, so I got to do the show, and he was like, hey, can you, like, get me something from the show? Like, even the confetti that they, like, yeah. dropped down on the ceiling. And I was like, I got you. So I went around, and I picked up – so I picked up this. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so I have this. I got two of them. Uh, one, I kept one for myself, and I put it in a, por- in, a, in, a in a frame, and then I got another one for him. It just is a gorilla position from the to show you where to go backstage. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I took one of those. Yeah, I, Conrad has always been, like, super cool with me. He's like, great. Uh, yeah, he, like, um, we had uh, Eric Bischoff uh, do a little film, a little thing for us one time for 440. It was like, he said, like, the following announcement is paid for by the yeah. 440. And that was just, I just asked Conrad, I was like, Hey, can, can you ask Eric to do this? Like it it could even be like a webcam, him sitting down for your guys' podcast. Like, I don't care. And he, I have like a two or three minute long video of Eric Bischoff saying this, the following announcement is paid for by the 440, like 15, 16 different ways. (laughs) And there's like a green screen behind him with like the 440 logo. Like Conrad just went above and beyond. And, um, I remember Conrad just reached out to me and was like, Hey, do you want to do something on the show? And I was like, absolutely. And, uh, so he asked me to do that. And I was in the battle Royal and I remember him being like, Hey, I'm really sorry that you you're only in the battle Royal. And I was like, dude, it's fine. Like I yeah. don't need to be like, it, this is like murderer's row of like, it was a good wrestling. one. Yeah. That yeah. show was awesome. And like, I was like, just the fact that I'm even here. And I said, the only, I was like, the only thing I want is I've never been to Starcast. Like, can I get a hotel room for the whole weekend? And I'm, I'm I drove down because I wanted to drive because I had been flying yeah. a lot that recently, and I was like, I can't get on another plane right now. And Nashville's not that far from me, so I drove down. He had me a, a nice hotel for the whole weekend. I went to Starcast, hung out, went to the the roast, and just like it was it was a super cool weekend. Like it was a good time. And I remember at the end they were like gathering everybody up, and they're like, Hey guys, go out there, go out there, just go stand by the ring. Or Flair's like, you know, a, a retirement yeah. speech. I was like, all right, cool. Well, then Flair was like, 
outside the ring and i was like what do you want us to do they're like just go out there so like me and blake christian just happened to be like the first people to walk out so we walked around the ring and we just ended up standing behind him so the whole time he's talking like just me and blake christian are standing there and like i remember sitting there and being like this is really weird and then i like looked over and i was like oh that's uh the undertaker and Bret Hart. <laughs> i was like oh and foley and i was like oh my god like what the, what is going on <laughs> it was wild it's so I, wild there was people backstage. I remember I literally, like, actually bumped into Kid Rock. Like, I physically I did not into. know that he was there. <laughs> he was just hanging out. So I, like, was coming around this corner, and I bumped into someone, and I was like, oh, my bad. And I, like, looked up, and it was Kid Rock. And WWE and like, Hall of Famer Kid Rock. <laughs> and I bumped into him, and I looked, and I was like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> and he started laughing, and I was like, yo, my bad, dude. He's like, no. He's like, there's too many people over here. I was like, yo, Jeff Jarrett's over there, like in his locker room. Go say hi. He's like, oh, for real? He's like, yeah. So he like ugh, walked away. But I like actually bumped into Kid Rock. It was just a couple of surreal moments. Just a couple of Southern music stars right there. Jeff Jarrett and, and Kid Rock. You love it. <laughs> but yeah, it was, I always found it weird that Kid Rock was like, yeah, Southern Rock. He could piss into Canada from his back porch, I think. 100%. So I'm like, he's out there living next to, to Ethan Page right now somewhere. Mm-hmm. My God, you, yeah, that you me- show was crazy. You mentioned that gorilla wild. position thing that you have. Are there any other like sentimental things that you you've kept or anything that you've come across that you're like, hell yeah, I got to keep that. Uh, I I have a lot of stuff, and most of it's in the storage down downstairs. Um, I've only recently started to get a bit sentimental about stuff. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes I'm like, oh, man, I've done so much stuff, but I really don't – like, I'm not a big collector. I don't keep things. Yeah. Um, the few things that I have are mostly just, like, personal wrestling stuff. But um, I'm trying to think if there's anything cool. I was able to give a, a guy who – I called his MMA fight, and he knocked a guy out, and the dude's blood got all over my notes. I was able to give the guy that knocked him out the notes, and he was like, fuck, yeah. That's cool. It's like, there, there are some cool things, like – I think the Omega Callahan match, some of the thumbtacks rolled out towards me, and I, I just picked up a couple and kept them. I was like, this is a cool memory. I have um, actually Marcus Crane, before he passed, gave me a glove that Danny Havoc used to wear when he did death matches. Oh, I have, okay. So I have that. I have one, one of Danny Havoc's uh, gloves that he used to wear. Because it's funny because uh, when I was doing death matches back then, um, Danny would always be like, wear gloves, like wear gloves. And I'm like, man, nah, I ain't, nah, I don't do that. <laughs> like, and I remember my hands just getting shredded. And um, so eventually I started wearing gloves. And I had seen him once uh before he had passed and he was like i knew you were gonna start wearing gloves i was like yeah bro i should have listened to you i was like my hands were messed up so it's I, i'm glad that i have that so that, that's something i'm sure there's more stuff i just can't 22 years of wrestling and just stuff being thrown in a box somewhere like i'm sure i got plenty of, of stuff. course but yeah but th- those are the the gorilla position one i thought was really cool and, the, and that that glove's uh pretty neat too as we start to wrap up mlw on reels every tuesday guys make sure you check that out uh, Dan, the dad, told us that you were the first person to take the dad joke. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I would love to hear how that was, like, maybe pitched to you. Because I think maybe some people that aren't familiar, like, to a wide degree of your work think death matches, uh, you know, the 440 stuff. For and sure. they're like, really, him? Yeah, I, I can't. Well, so he- Dan used to come up to Alpha One, um, Ethan Page's promotion in yes. Canada, before he started doing the gimmick. And it was, like, just talked about, like, jokingly in the back. And I remember me and Ethan Page being like, dude, do this gimmick. Like, do this gimmick. gimmick. It's, like, it's really good. Like, and I remember, too, we even had, like, a, a side, uh, like, a heel character for him to do where he was uh, uh, his stepdad, Dan. Yes. <laughs> And where he wore like a pair of jeans and like a leather jacket, and he'd be like, "Yeah, I'm taking your mother out," like you know, stuff he's, like that. He's got a half empty bottle of Budweiser, not Bud yeah. Light, Budweiser, smoking yeah. a cigarette. <laughs> exactly, but I think I, if I remember correctly, he just like said he had like an idea, and he didn't know if it would work, and he just pitched it to me, and I think I died laughing. I was like, "Yo, that's." hilarious i was like yes of course you can do that if i'm not mistaken i think that might have been a scramble for freelance wrestling and we all were on the apron and it was like two at a time like an old school ring of honor um scramble the way they should be done young people if you don't know what i'm talking about but anyways um (laughs) so i remember like dan was on the apron and they were just like they wanted dan in so bad 
like so bad. And it was at Logan Square Auditorium, which is a great venue, always good crowds. And I remember when Dan got tagged in, it was so loud <laughs> that like the ring was vibrating from noise. Like, I love like, it. The room was like shaking. I, I got chills from it. I'm kind of getting chills thinking about it now. It was such a loud reaction when he got tagged in. So yeah, Dan, Dan the dad's the man. <laughs> I was so happy. Like, <laughs> It's so happy to see that make it onto TV. And For uh, sure. one of our interviewers like popped me. He goes, did you check on Toa Leona afterwards and like apologize for working stiff? <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. It was so good. Uh, cool. I-, I love that fun place like that absolutely has a place in wrestling a- as well. And I mean, God, we see all the stuff Dan Housen's doing on a weekly basis. Of course. As well. But uh, tell the people where they can follow you on social media, all that good stuff. Of course, MLW and Reels every single week. Yes, MLW, Tuesday nights, 10 p.m. Right on, It's on right after Live Patrol or Cops, I think. So if you're looking, you know, if you're in there watching Cops, getting all sweaty, and just keep on keep on rolling and then watch MLW. Um, I'm at Ricky Shane Page on everything, uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, all that jazz. Um, I actually just started a new thing that I, I wouldn't mind plugging if it's okay. Hell yeah, I'm, absolutely. I, I started a very small indie promotion mm-hmm. where um, it's for young students to learn how to wrestle. It won't be streamed uh, to the world because I think that people don't get a chance to uh, fail because they have to fail in front of the world on Fight TV. And it's just it's not really conducive yeah. to learning. So I've started a new uh, promotion where it, everything's behind a paywall on Patreon. So if there's any fans that want to watch it, you have to be a part of the Patreon to be able to see any of it. And, it, and they're just going to have, like, a safe place to, like, learn and grow. So just go to rcwwrestling.net, and that's the Patreon. And, and the first show is uh, in Cleveland. The room only holds about 50 people, so that's all going to be locals. But it's just something, a little passion project that I'm really into right now, and uh, I, I kind of want people to get involved with it and be on the ground floor of, like, helping some younger wrestlers learn the craft. And, uh, and, and like I said, just have a safe place to, to fail and to get better. Guys, you'll be able to check that out in the link in the description below or at the bottom of the article that you're reading. I love that idea. I think that's great because I can't count how many times people are in their first five to ten matches and I see their stuff getting buried on like Twitter or something. Yeah, it's and sucks. it's and it's, like you look back, Deanna Perazzo's like sixth or seventh match was on Impact pay per view. Like not everybody like learns uh, that way, and they, yeah, they Ashley, you know Ashley Dembois. Yeah, she was like her on, first match ever was on dark. It was on dark, yeah. That's and she's really good. She and is. luckily she did well, but like imagine if your first match ever was on dark. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, so like I I I had so many little indies to like learn and mess up and thank God no one saw them. You know, they, weren't, <laughs> they weren't even recorded, you know, for that matter. So like that's kind of what like the idea behind this. It's a small indie. I got replica belts with stickers on them. Like I'm really, like, I love it. <laughs> I'm making it like a real promotion, but it's just for learning purposes. And I'm also the other side of it. So I'm going to have some of my veteran friends agent in the back. So oh, that's incredible. They, they can learn from them. And then also my friends that may not think that they could have ever done that as a job could get a little bit of experience doing it. And that's maybe something they want to pursue you know, um, later on at a much higher level. And I also think that the indies in general could really use agents. And I think that's something that, uh, I think indie promotion should start doing, to be honest, is it's cause, uh, things just become repetitive and, and people don't learn and, and it, it's just, it's not good for wrestling. So that's kind of where the whole idea behind this is. I once went to an indie and three straight months, they brought in their name, right? One, one month it was Al Snow, one month it was Shark Boy, one month it was Eugene. I go there and I watch them. Month one, Shark Boy is biting the local guy's ass the whole whole match, and I'm like, oh, okay. The second month, Al Snow is trying to shove head up the local guy's ass the whole match, and I'm like, wait a minute. The third month, Eugene is there, and I'm like, fine, I'm gonna get to see Nick Densmore wrestle. What could he possibly shove up this guy's ass? He spent the whole show shoving his thumb up the local guy's ass, and I was like. Oh, all right then. And I was like, you know what? I would like some variety here. <laughs> I would like exactly. some variety here. That and so from from month to month. And uh, I, I think that agenting and producing would be valuable, and especially considering that you are contracted to a major company to to produce. Now, I think that's I think that's incredible. I love this idea, uh, but encourage you guys to check that out. Ricky Shane Page, thank you so much for taking the time. 
No worries, man. Thank you. Until next time, guys, we're out.